Stephannouncer.com Buffalo Reminds me of a human monkey wrench. He's kind of like, <laughs> he, he, he's fixing everything, isn't he? He's like Mr. Fix-It on this team. Uh, he's watching it with his bare eyeballs. I couldn't believe I mean, guys were getting just pole chopped right over the head. What a stupid, ridiculous thing to say. That'll put you down so low, you'll be like well dung, and you won't want to come out of it for a while. <laughs> if I met the guy that sang that song, I think I'd throw acid in his face. And you know some? And isn't that a disgusting thing I just said? We had the lights down real low. We put a smoking jacket on, slippers. Mm -hmm. It was great. But they're, they're like trained pigs when they show up. <laughs> Yeah. They don't even think. He said, uh, you know, in every barrel there's a rotten apple and you're it. Who's running this show anyways? Buffalo penalty to number three, Mike Robitaille. Two minutes for unsportsmanlike conduct, a 10-minute misconduct, another 10-minute misconduct, and a game misconduct. The time just then. They've got blood coming out of their eyes at that point. Oh, my goodness. They get hungry. They slobber. They do all kinds of crazy things because they get hungry. I, I, I would advise them to stop talking and irritating people. I'm just the monkey, not the organ grinder. Now why didn't they shut his pie hole up? <laughs> huh? <laughs> this guy's wound up like an eight-day watch. I mean, he, he, he just can't relax. Do you remember? I mean, he is really. He's like a tuning fork. Yeah. And he's got to learn to relax a little bit. Right. In the immortal words of Fedor Dostoevsky, there's only one king. We're talking about fountains yeah. now, man. Yeah. This stuff is blowing out of their head three feet. Who is the only Texas A&M player to win the Heisman Trophy? Uh, Jerry West. You're just embroiling people to the point you're going to get pole chopped sooner or later. Yeah, it's this fine line between stupidity and uh, macho. I didn't have the guts to hit him. I, I did it once, and I paid such a price I never did it again. Payment. Payment. I backed off every time. I let him have the center any time he wanted it. Because if I wanted to do it, I was going to get a stick. So right he, the, he, got it, he made his point. Yes, he did. He certainly did. A lot of players made their point with me. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, what do I have to worry about right. sleep for? I'll get all I want when I'm dead. It was like talking to a head of lettuce. <laughs> the whole thing is uh, too disgusting to talk about. He, he will absolutely, he, he'll break your nose, break your jaw. He'll make your head cave in. That has to be, without a question, the dumbest thing I've ever heard come out of your mouth. I'll tell you, if I was a Finnegan, if what I would do, I'd come over here right now and punch you right in the mouth. <laughs> Up and down, just like a toilet seat. And such an arrogant, snotty little... Uh, I just want to see him turn around and just reach over there and grab him by the throat and choke him. <laughs> yeah, he's got a huge pump, and uh, it really shows. I think that there was a synapse in his development. There's no synapse in his development. It's it's a, just an awful thing you said. It's disgraceful. Okay. Why you would even think Give me that he would brain. go to the minors. Shut up. I would take Wally with his feet cut off. Is that the ballad of Dwight Fry? You know, you got dry skin, you're spilling water on the floor, you're, you're, you're a mess. There isn't one individual on this team that has taken this team up to where it belongs right now, and it desperately needs somebody to grab it by the corns. Who is David Stern? Uh, Art Stern's son. Be a pro. What? Deal I can't with, overcome that. Deal with a little... A little <laughs> I can't overcome that ignorance. Deal with a little distraction. Will I bite my apple? No, thanks. I just had a banana, and I have my pants pressed also. Who's the best defenseman in the NHL? Oh, that's easy. Uh, Art Fay. Yeah. Are you amused? Do you find that funny? There are hard feelings and uh, players you hated. Players you would actually go home and dream about at night, maybe back in your car up over their head. That one pearl, too. I mean, I, I've been answer for everything, man. It's good working with Uncle Bucko today, isn't it? But they had it going defensively, and then they puked. I get a very nice feeling. I came into this town today. It was... Uh, it was like a town that I grew up in, Midland, Ontario. It has the same feel to it. Certainly didn't have a cemetery like you have. That's pretty <laughs> impressive. And, um, but uh, not every place gives you that feeling. So I think what you have here is a lovely, comfortable place to live. And uh, uh, it's pretty impressive to come in here. I kind of forgot how nice it was because it's been so long, but uh, thank you for letting me get to meet you and spend some time with you. Well, this is a highlight for us. Uh, Mid Midland, Ontario. Yeah. Um, that's where you were born. And you really, I just read that you were the, uh, uh, probably the only person from Midland, Ontario to have played with the, in the NHL. That's right. And there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of kids that came along that had that dream. And... Uh, that's a uh, that's something that most uh, Canadian boys grow up with is uh, 
a dream to play in the National Hockey League. I suppose you could relate that to playing professional baseball or football or going away to play college uh, football or baseball down here in the States, but it's really, uh, it's really the pinnacle if you can pull it off. And there's a lot of kids that came through the hockey system for many, many years, so I'm not quite sure why it was me, but I got to carry that badge of honor for them, and um, it was a great thrill. There was a big upside. There's a lot of, a lot of downsides to being a professional athlete also. It wasn't all good. So Midland, where is it? That's about 100 miles north of Toronto. It's right on Georgian Bay. And some of you people that went up to Toronto and beyond, you might have noticed a city called Barrie, Ontario, and it's about 40 miles past Barrie. It's on a beautiful body of water. It's almost as large as one of the Great Lakes, which is called Georgian Bay. So that's the baby of 11. And um, there's not many of us left. I'm 67 now, so I get the... Uh, not the pleasure, but unfortunately, I get to things go along correctly and in order. I unfortunately have to bury all my brothers and sisters before it's over, and it's uh, they're moving along very quickly. So I try to spend as much time as I can with them and make sure I uh, know all the facts and figures about my family before I lose them. So as you've grown up in north of Toronto, the Maple Leafs were your team. Um, you know, that, that was everyone's team, except I, I've always had this, um, I don't know why I haven't figured it out yet. Maybe now that I'm retired, I can get it figured out, but then, uh, whether I was broadcasting or playing or whatever it was, I always, you know, a group went left, I always went right. I always ended up being the rebel. I always ended up being the pain in the neck and, uh, saying the wrong things or saying the truth. And, uh, which in the uh, sports business and the broadcasting businesses, uh, but the last thing you want to do is tell the truth, depending upon how long you want to keep your job. So, so was this the, the time period where Hockey Night in Canada was the institution? Yes, it was. It was everything. It was um, a typical Saturday night. In, in those days, it would come on, you'd only catch the last half of the game. It would come on, like, I think at 8.15 or 8 o'clock or something like that, and half the game would be over. But you wouldn't have to listen to it on radio. you you get the games during the week on radio, and you'd be there with your dad and the rest of the kids, and they'd all be sitting around listening to the game, you know, and working the dials, and the hope it comes in tonight, and it's just snowing out, it's going to be clear, you know, when we pick up the Detroit game. And uh, but Saturday night was a very special night because you could actually watch and see and uh, visualize. Actually, you know, you, you visualize all these things as a young boy. You dream about it. And you, you dream about being in the National Hockey League and you hear about these players. But that's the nice thing about radio also is that you can be very descriptive and you can kind of build these beautiful little scenarios for the situation that I'm talking about now. It's all a dream, and you could build that dream up for kids in any way, shape, or form you, you'd like if you're a broadcaster. So to actually see them, Greg X playing, was like bigger than life. I, I mean, it was just, you know, beyond belief. And uh, junior hockey in those days was like, that was as big as the NHL also. The NHL teams owned all the junior teams. Be like all the NFL teams owning all the college football teams. And uh, they would come in and sign these boys, you know, say a real good young player here in Jamestown. The New York Giants would come in and maybe sign them and put them in their school and bring them along. And if he was good enough someday to turn pro, then he'd have to play for the Giants. It wasn't even legal until we got that straightened out. And um, uh, But that's how you finally you know, crawled your way up into the National Hockey League. Was uh, being an announcer and many many years as such a successful announcer was Foster Hewitt was that the godfather of your yeah work? he was he he was uh, he was the guy and then Foster retired uh, and then died shortly after his retirement and his son took over who wasn't very good but he he certainly had uh, he had the the name that would carry the day and his father made sure he got that job and uh, Bill Hewitt did it for many years and then there was just one after another after that, and uh, 
but Foster was the guy. He would, so what uh, what do you think of Don Cherry? Well, I, I really know John, uh, Don well, and uh, I know him maybe a little differently than most people. Uh, he, he comes off half crazed, and um, I, you know, I don't have a problem with Don at all. As a matter of fact, everyone that's critical of, you know, of his uh, of his work, they almost break their necks trying to when he comes on, trying to get to the TV to watch him to see what he's going to say next. So. He's uh, for advertising. He's a dream, and uh, for selling advertising, he's even a bigger dream for the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. So, he's outspoken. Uh, he's colorful. He is a color man, and that's what he's there for. He's not there to bore you and lie to you. He's there to invigorate you, uh, to get you thinking, uh, whether you agree with it or not. Uh, your mind is going to get active when you listen to him. And he hits a lot of emotions. You know, it's not unusual to see him make you laugh, fall on the floor laughing, and before the show's over, you know, he'll have you on the floor crying uh, from sad, being so sad about something. And he has the ability to do that because he's an extremely emotional individual. Does an awful lot for people that, which is the case, I think, for a lot of athletes uh, that you'd never hear about. and. Um, uh, he's just done a lot of things that, and that's really difficult. I, athletes aren't really good at it, and either our owners or generally people with money is, uh, you know, if they're going to give something, they certainly want to get something in return, and I understand that, and uh, I'm like that myself to a certain degree, but I think charity, pure charity, is to do it and uh, not make an issue of it. And just just do it. You don't need to make a splash about it. I don't want anyone to make a splash about it. Then walk away and just um, um, react to that charity in that fashion, instead of turning it into a the Mike Robitaille day. Well, as uh, you're describing, Don. That's for someone else to do. Yeah. You know, to uh, put that name on it, not for me. So um, it's just a it's just a personal feeling I have. Well, as you were describing Don Cherry, I, it almost sounded like an autobiographical dis description of you. I, uh, yeah, I, in a lot of ways, I, uh, I try to uh, be a lot like Don. Uh, uh, the only difference between Don and I is about possibly $15 million. <laughs> <laughs> which, which way? Yeah. <laughs> you know, the guy makes more money. Uh, his... Um, the exposure he gets on Hockey Night in Canada is so strong up up in the up in Canada that he'd do that job for nothing. I mean, I'm not sure exactly what Don makes through that, but it's peanuts compared to what he really makes. But if he had to pay them to do it, it'd be well worth his money. He's often said because he's, uh, that's it's his exposure, and uh, he turns around, he sells his uh, you know his little video every year, uh, greatest hits he calls it, I think. His son puts it together, and they sell enough to, he gives his boy, I think, close to a million dollars a year. His kid picks up and he handles the whole thing. Of course, when you pay your taxes in Canada, that leaves about $40. But <laughs> that's not going to be any better as the Liberals just got in. I don't know if you heard that. But, uh, the Pierre Trudeau's son is now our Prime Minister in Canada. And uh, I offered them Barack, and they didn't want him. So. <laughs> you left school after completing the eighth grade to devote all of your time and energy to the sport. Is that a hard thing for you? Yeah, I uh, really paid a, um, a... If I had to do it all over again, I'd never give up my education. And that probably uh, was the one thing that made broadcasting so difficult for me, is that I had to, because of the lack of education, uh, and it wasn't unusual in those days for the players just to go to grade 8 or grade 9, and you take it decades before my age bracket, my parents, the deal there was you go to school until you learn to read and write in grade 3, and then you go work on the farm and you take over the farm. That, that, that was just the way it was. And um, we used to, we'd go to, you know, grade seven, eight, nine. It was the same thing with Bobby Orr. Bobby grew up just up the road from me. 
And uh, I don't think Bobby has any more than grade nine or grade ten. Um, but there's a, there, it, it made it so much, it was so difficult. You know, everything you had to do, you had to double check. And it would be, you know, I had to constantly yelling down to my wife, how do you spell this? How do you spell that? Is this correct? Does this sound correct when I say this? Um, and it was never easy. It, you know, in a way, I never worked a day in my life in that job, but in some ways, because of that lack of education, there was such a, a price to pay. It was went, went against all the dictates of common sense that I'd end up being in an industry where you, ha you should have, you know, be able to put a couple sentences together. And I really worked hard at that, and that, that's probably what I'm most proud of, and I, I really, really worked hard and went back to school later on and just took some, a lot of courses online and went to the UB, took some uh, courses there on basic structure of the English language and so on. And I got better. And um, I reached the point now where, you know, I could almost hold a conversation. <laughs> but it was, uh, it was a long trip and it wasn't a very nice trip. And, I spent a lot of time, especially now in my retirement, speaking to kids in schools, uh, begging them if I have to, to just, just, you know, do everything you possibly can to complete your education. And unfortunately, high school isn't going to cut it. Uh, university, university barely cuts it now, but you better specialize in something and, uh, or it's going to be a... You know, you got a tough go in front. I'm not saying you can't make it, I mean, you know, uh, but it would be a lot easier. You know, if you had your druthers, I'd rather have the education and try to make it without it. And it's there for you, and I think certainly there's every opportunity in the world for any kid to, uh, there's enough doors opened up for them, they can kick them down if they're not. And I think probably all of us in here would admire any kid that, uh, had a willingness to uh, kick the door down to get his education. We'd be more than happy to help out. You'd be so impressed with it, and it would be so nice to see that uh, that energy um, instead of just holding your hand out, holding your hand out. Um, so it, it was. Um, uh, that's an interesting question, and I thank you for that question because that's one that's one I've always uh, had a hard time with. So, but I got over it. You know, I just had to work at it. And very exceedingly well. Uh, you get signed by the Rangers, and you were talking yeah. about how that system worked back. I was 14 when I signed by the signed way. Signed by the, in Kitchener, right? Yeah, so all the lawyers in here take heed of that. 14 years old, the New York Rangers come up, come up to town. Now, are you kidding me? That'd be like having, you know, the biggest name in football walk in here to sign your boy to a contract. I mean, my dad labored his whole life, and it was just old Ernie the plumber, old Ernie the plumber. It was nothing. And uh, but when his boy was signed by New York, it was that's uh, that's Mike's dad. <laughs> it changed a little bit. And I got a uh, got a beautiful jacket. I insisted on uh, besides very little money, uh, insisted on a, a nice New York Ranger jacket for him. So that really uh, that set him up for the next couple of years and. You got a lot of enjoyment out of that, watching me grow and become a professional hockey player. A great, a lot of pride in that, and uh, for that reason alone, it was worth uh, taking that journey. But it's 14, I mean, that's it, you leave school. And they had a junior team down in Kitchener. I, went, I left home, played junior hockey for five years, turned pro. I was voted the best defenseman in all of Canada. That's like being the best lineman in college football. And I turned pro that year, and I got a $5,000 signing bonus. <laughs> and uh, if I didn't make the New York Rangers, in which I had to beat out two Hall of Famers if I was going to make it. I had to beat out Harry Howell and Tim Horton. That wasn't going to happen. And uh, so I was sent to Omaha. And I had to spend a year down in Omaha. We won the championship down there. I set scoring records, made the first all-star team, voted the best defense. <coughs> defenseman. I won every award you could possibly win. I wasn't even invited to training camp the next year with the New York Rangers. That's how tough it was. Went back the next year, we won the championship again. The same thing, broke my scoring record, 
won the championship. They sent me to, old, uh, to Buffalo to play for the old Buffalo Bisons, if you remember the old American League team. It was the last year there in Buffalo. We won the championship here, two championships in one year, and I finally got a crack the next year at, uh, tr to make the New York Rangers. Played about a little bit, and then I was traded to Detroit. And uh, played about maybe three or four months there. I got to play with Gordy Howe. It was worth it. And then I was traded to Buffalo that, uh, that following summer and spent three or four years there and then finished up my career in, uh, in Vancouver. Let's drop some uh, names here. Uh, you're, let's. Yeah, so, uh, I thought I did. Yeah, well, you did. <laughs> did uh, let's just focus in on this. During your uh, OHA days, I mean, your paths crossed with a guy named Orr, Bobby Orr. Yeah. What, did he have the reputation at that time period that he ultimately had? Um, as I mentioned earlier, Bobby and I grew up together just about 30 miles apart, and it was always the scouts in those days from the NHL team. There were only six NHL teams then. And the hot properties they were after was this kid in Midland, Mike Robitaille, and there's another kid, but he's very small up in Perry Sound, of Bobby Orr. He's just up the street up the road, so you can see one play the other from one night to the next, or a lot of nice their teams play against one another. And they're, you know, I was much better than him, and, um, but he was still good, you know, but he's very, very small. He's just a munchkin, very small. <laughs> and, but he had a great coach. He got a, the Toronto Maple Leafs had a defensive called Bucko McDonald, who had retired and uh, was kind of out in the street, and Perry Sound, Ontario, gave him, a, gave him a job to run the whole minor hockey system. And, of course, he got his hands on Bobby Orr and really, you know, taught him so much. I mean, over the summer, he taught him, worked with him. Street, on the streets, where, you know, in garages, shooting tennis balls. I mean, he just taught him a lot. He came back that following year. I was 13, Bobby was 13, and you never watched any individual go by me so quick in all your life as, as he did that year in one year. One summer, he just exploded. There was no comparison. There was Bobby Orr and then there's this other guy, Robitaille. I don't know what the hell happened to him, but he said, you know, <laughs> now it's Orr. And uh, so Boston signed him and New York signed me. And uh, obviously it worked out pretty good. <laughs> Because in my mind, he's the best hockey player I've ever watched. He's, uh, he's a spectacular, beautiful guy, very humble. You'd have a hard time getting him up here to speak. And um, you have something to say about him, you'd probably crawl underneath the table and hide out of embarrassment. He's just he's a very, very humble guy. Lovely, lovely, uh, lovely guy. And um, didn't have much when he grew up. And, Worked for everything he got, but he was something. I, I'm going to tell you, he was just a world class. Nobody like him, and he did it on bad knees, and he did it from a defensive position. All right, all those points, 100, and, what do you get, like 113 points or something one year playing defense. 113 points. It's a, unbelievable. Um, and he re, he reinvented the whole game for defensemen how to play. Then all of a sudden, it was guys where if you want to make some money in this game, you've got to be good offensively. And if you're real good offensively, then they start paying you some money. So something I didn't see in my first couple of years, because I, like in Omaha, it was 6,000 to play in Omaha, and, if I, and if, I didn't make the, if I didn't make the New York Rangers, which I knew I wasn't going to make it, and uh, if I made the New York Rangers, I made 12500 When I was there, my wife and I used to go into uh, Manhattan the day of the game. We'd be playing in Madison Square Gardens on a Sunday. And we'd go in early and drive around Manhattan trying to find a parking spot where I wouldn't have to pay for parking. Because <laughs> parking was like about $18 then if to park even then across the street from Madison Square Gardens. And... Um, I mean, that's it. And when the season was over, you just go get a shovel and go to work. Go home, go to work. You work all summer long because you never had enough money. And this is the National Hockey League. Those crooks, those owners in those days, <laughs> um, 
they were such such thieves, and they had such control of your whole life. Um, it was so far be, from being legal; it was, uh, you know, wasn't even a there wasn't even a question to be raised about it. But they, it just happened that way, and we took it. We didn't know any better. They'd have 14 exhibition games to start the season off. Okay, now they play six. We play, used to play 14. They made enough money from those 14 uh, games, exhibition games, to pay for the whole sal pay everyone's salary for the year. Took care of the whole thing. It was all gravy after that. So then they, you know, they bitch and complain about, well, we had to pay a million seven for the team. You know, we're losing money. But when they sold it for 170, they, they never mentioned that they paid 1.7 for I, You know, they lost a little bit in the front end and made it up with a great deal on the back end. So, so you were the Rangers for a few games, but then you're traded yeah. to the Detroit Red Wings. And there on the team, you walk into the locker room, and there is the ultimate guy you listened or heard about from Foster <laughs> Hewitt, Gordy Howe. Yeah. Was there an all factor? I couldn't play the first. The reason I didn't make the well, there's a lot of reasons why I didn't make the National Hockey League. One, it was just difficult to make it at the beginning, no matter how good you were in junior hockey. There was no room for you. Um, you had to wait for someone to retire. And but still, outside that reason, the biggest biggest problem I had was I was in such awe of being there. I was so overcome of being in the dress room and actually being on the ice with all my heroes that I could never be who I should have been. I went from really looking like a potentially a really good, great NHL player, and I just went to a very average. Uh, just you know, scratching, trying to you know make it, make it, make it, and doing well in the minors. But I get to the NHL and I'd be standing there. We'd have a game against Chicago, and Bobby Hull would be lined up on the other side. Again, I, I couldn't. I, I was just overcome. And then finally, one day, and I don't know, maybe all of us or some of you have had that point in your life where experience finally kicked in, and you didn't. Uh, Lie in bed sweating all night, worrying about the next day, about something or your job or keeping your job or whatever it was. But I, I had a comfort level all of a sudden. And from there on in, it was a lot better. It was a lot easier and I stepped up. A lot of the guys that I had trouble playing against, performing against, what happened is those guys actually got older and they moved on and left. And I find, found myself in that position where these kids, as I, were coming in looking at me, and they were in awe of me, as I was of the guys before me. So it kind of just, that's how it took its, its place, how I worked my way through the, the whole system. But having played with how... I see, it was on the play, I couldn't even talk. Greg is, is sitting there with me. Uh, you know, just like, <laughs> and Gordy, he never said anything. He was so quiet. He was more humble than uh, you know uh, Bobby Orr. He wouldn't say a word. He was just more, just the nicest guy in the world. Um, pain all the time when he played. He had wrists, great big, like they're like soup bones, and they they're all full of arthritis and everything. He used to, there's a little sink he used to have for him down at the end of the bench in the dressing room. And they put the hot water on, and he'd sit down there, and he'd keep his, you know, his, his uh, wrist, both his wrists, underneath the hot water, because you know the moist heat it would give him some relief, and then go out and play, and come back, and have to do it again, and um, no shoulders, all neck. His neck started here and <laughs> ended up in his hips. Um, he was just like. I watched him, boy, they said he was one of the toughest I've ever played, and I, I watched him do some things on that ice. He, you would throw up if I ever told you, and nobody would want to come near him. You couldn't get near him, because he had a, if you want to get near him, you had to go through his stick. I mean, he just, you'd have to be a beaver and eat all that wood. <laughs> would, and he was just willing to give it to you, and uh, I always remember, I always remember his buddy, Tommy Webster, just a young guy that just broke in. 
and uh, he was like, uh, he always used to hang around with. It's a microphone. That's a yeah, microphone. for his day here. And uh, <laughs> Tommy, um, for some reason, Gordy took a shine to him. And we are playing in Philadelphia, and I think it was Bob Kelly or somebody behind the play gave it to his buddy Tommy Webster, and Tommy came over to the bench for the change, and his mouth, blood was pouring out of his mouth, and some of his teeth were missing, and, you know, little Tommy Webster, he's, he never, he's afraid to go out at night, and he never, <laughs> never hurt anybody, and this guy, you know, a lot bigger than him, picked on him and took advantage of his size, but anyways, Gordy jumps over the boards, takes a spot, and the puck went up the ice, the re and it was in this end, the referee blew the whistle, and to this day, nobody, we're still wondering what the hell happened, because you, you have never seen so much blood in all your life on the ice, as when he was done with him, uh, you know, evening thing, even things up, and he just carved him up like a, he was a ham, and uh, <laughs> That's what it was like. I mean, in those days, you didn't, uh, you know, you tried to pull any of that stuff on someone, you better pack a lunch because you're going to be there for a while because there'd be a lot of guys coming at you to even things up. And so it, you kind of policed yourself in the, throughout the league because you knew there was a great, um, there was a price to pay. And uh, there was a great price to pay for a lot of them. Well, you're, you're, you're not shy. You were not shy on the ice. I mean, Mike, was there... But was there one or two players that you knew they were on the ice, uh, uh, and you'd say, geez, I really hope we don't kind of gather together here? I, I was uh, afraid of so many players. I had fear of a lot of players. And uh, I guess you're not supposed to say that, but uh, you know, when I talk to some of my old teammates now, it's something they, you know, they pretty well fess up and say, yeah. There was this guy, that guy, this guy, that guy, you know. I there there were nights I couldn't I couldn't sleep the night before a game. The sheets were on the floor in the morning and soaking wet. I was, I was sweating, I was rolling and tossing. It's just the fear of having to go up against some guy that you hit in the last game and you know he's going to get you. And the clock is ticking. It's like going to the dentist. You know what's going to hurt. You just don't know how much. <laughs> and you get there, and sure enough, it happens. So, yeah, I had a lot of fear of a lot of guys. And uh, I'm sure there were some of them that had fear about me also. And you want to name a name or two? Have, oh, there are, uh, Gordy Howe, <laughs> for starters. Wayne Cashman, Dennis Hextall, Vic Hadfield. Um... Uh, John Ferguson. I remember the first game I was playing for Detroit. We are playing in Montreal. Was I with Detroit? Yeah. And Jean Beliveau is like God. In, in, he's like, you know, Montreal. Jean Beliveau is the king. And um, <clears throat> really an elegant individual and an elegant player. And, great stature on the ice and great respect. And um, I was too stupid to know any better, but it was right in Montreal and he came waltzing through the middle with his head down. And I hit him so hard. It's just like, there was a big wheeze came out of him. His, his glove came off, went flying at one end. His stick went flying down the other end. Now, I end up down on the ice too, and I look over the Montreal bench, and John Ferguson's coming over the boards <laughs> after me. And he is just like a monster. You know, it's the worst nightmare. He's the last guy you ever want to see. And um, yeah, I, it was just ugly when he played. He, they couldn't even feed him. He wouldn't <laughs> even. <clears throat> it just wasn't, there's was something wrong. And he. Uh, so I can see him coming over the boards, and I fall down on the ice, and I go to get up, and I look over again, and he's over the boards at this point, and he's coming back to me. I roll back down, oh, you know, like I hurt myself. Anyway, now that I look around, my teammates are on the ice. I've got, in the history of the National Hockey League, the four smallest guys you have ever 
you ever had a look at, and all my teammates are on the ice at that point. <laughs> now they all pretend they're not seeing it. They're all looking at the screen. They're like, they know Ferguson's coming, you can hear him. <clears throat> He's got hair in his nose, and hair in the balls of his feet. And he's just there for a reason, and that that reason at that point was to beat the hell out of me because I'm you're not supposed to hit uh, Jean Beneville. So I stayed down the ice, and he came up, and he, we didn't wear helmets. And we had long hair in those days, and he grabbed my hair in the back. I remember, it, and he started smashing my forehead in the ice. And he got about three good smashes on the ice like that before the referees came in and grabbed me, and they took their time. <laughs> because they know, you know, if you're stupid enough to hit Bellavo, you deserve everything to get. And uh, they didn't have to tell me the second time, because so I never did it again. And uh, he was such a uh, he was such a gentleman. And I, you know, I just I don't know why I did it. Maybe because I wanted to make the NHL. If I hit him, I would impress the team, and they would keep me there, and so on. So I did whatever I could to make it. And uh, that was the wrong thing to do. <laughs> well, then the Red Wings got right but, uh, yeah, yeah, Red. we went to Donnie Luce and I got traded to Buffalo. And uh, Donnie went on for a long, long career here. And uh, I got to spend plenty of time here in Buffalo, enough to fall in love with the city and the people. And um, uh, there was a big upside to playing in Buffalo. Besides, we had a team that won occasionally, which made quite a difference from what's happening nowadays. And um, it was close to Canada, close to home. It was financially, it was a comfortable place to live. Um, socially, it was comfortable. And uh, that became home for me. What Jim like? What was he like? An awful, awful guy. He was just really, uh, <laughs> he was not, he was mean to me. Uh, odd individual, very superstitious. Uh, Lied, lied to me a lot. Uh, couldn't keep his word. Um, difficult to work for. Not a reasonable person at all. But oddly enough, when my uh, when my dad died, there was a the burial was on way up in Midland, as I told you, about 100 miles north of Toronto, and um, there's a huge storm on that day. You could hardly see ten feet in front of you, and you know that son of a gun got a uh, got a limo and had somebody drive him all the way up there to the funeral, and showed up, and uh, you know having Punch Imlac uh, show up for your funeral in this little town, you know that'd be like having you know Roosevelt show up to your funeral here. So it was uh, it was a pretty big deal. My God, you should have heard that. Punch him, Max. Here, punch him. It was like you know, it was just, and it was for my dad. And um, so when I got back, uh, my wife insisted that I go up and thank him, and just kind of you know be a bigger man and just do it, you know. So I did, and he gave me the old wet fish handshake, and um, said uh, something to the like. You're welcome, and everything's back to normal. You know, <laughs> everything's back. Every, everything's back the same way. You know, it's just, you know, and that was it. But uh, yeah, that that was my uh, that was my adventure with him. So yeah, there, there was it was uh, I had a tough go with him. A tough go. With him. Yeah. You were paired with Tim Horton. Best best I ever played in my life uh, was when I was with Horton. Best defenseman I ever played with. One of the best to ever played the game. Um, Playing with Timmy the night he, we lost him. We had a game in Toronto. He was playing with a lot of pain that night in his jaw. I think he broke it the game before, but you know, the, the, you take a pass and the vibration of just the puck getting his stick will go up his arms and you know, the pain would just be awful. So he was taking a hell of a lot of 292s that night for the pain. And he was off the wagon, he wasn't drinking. And when the game was over, he was very lethargic, you know, and I said, uh, Timmy, do you want me to drive back with you? You know, and uh, because you, you look really tired. I said, you, you're all hopped up on this stuff. Or what? You know, how many of the 292s were 
in Canada at that time. You pick them up over the counter, and if you remember, they're like codeine. Now you can't get them. And uh, so he said, "No." Nah. He says, "Go on back with the guys." He said, "I'll see you in the morning at practice." I have to. My wife and my business partner uh, were having a meeting in Hamilton, and you'll be getting back too late. He said, "Go on back with the guys," but thanks. And uh, my wife woke me up in the morning, and that's what she told me. She said, you, uh, Timmy died. So he was my mentor, and I followed him around like a puppy dog. And uh, he's a, an extremely, um, extremely quiet, but really effective, led by what he did on the ice. Timmy never said two words to me how to play the game verbally but I learned how to play the game from just watching it. So that's how we became what we became uh, as players for a lot of us was watching Timmy. And we would, you know, we idolized him and we tried to imitate him. And even after I lost him, I still say I lost him. You know, I still get mad at him for not making it home that night. Especially when I lost him at that age and needed him desperately. And uh, so you go on, you, you move on, you go in the dressing room the next night, you walk in for the game, and the stall is empty. You know, you look over, and there's nobody sitting there. And you can't, you, you can barely play the game. Half the guys were just sobbing and everything. It was a very, very difficult thing to get over. And uh, we did, and uh, we moved on, but. Fond memories of uh, Tim Horton. I'm very fortunate to have him in my life. So, and uh, when I played with him, I, I learned more than anybody ever taught me about how to play hockey. There was no coach. Most of the coaches I had were not very good coaches. And uh, Horton was the best coach I ever had. The French Connection was part of your world. Yeah, I uh, put them in the Hall of Fame. That's right. <laughs> it was uh, played three years, three years with them, and Perot was just um, his game changer. I mean, it's just you hold the puck behind the net and set it up for him, and let him swing, pick it up full speed, and watch him go. And if you're on the bench, you were standing up just like you fans were watching the games. When you'd see him start to wind up from the own blue line, you know, the puck's behind the net, and pick it up full speed, and he was just like, bubble, bubble. you know, and down he'd go and just do these spectacular end-to-end -end rushes. And, and you know, now I don't know if Gilbert had the burning desire, say, of a Bobby Clark or a player like that, of that ilk, but if he would have, he, would, no question, would have been in the top six that ever played the game. And I think it just wasn't his makeup, you know. He's just an easygoing guy that just wants to sit around and have a beer and a pizza and laugh a lot and have some fun. And that was about it. And that was, you know, his makeup. But he made some great wingers, I'll tell you. He should have worked for Boeing, the aircraft. <laughs> And uh, anybody that ever got on his line, I mean, you know, their careers escalated in a hurry. It was always nice being on the ice with him, too. You could always count and pick up some points. You know, you get the puck to him, get the puck to him, feed him. You know, you don't have a great player like that and have him standing up there banging his stick on the ice waiting for the puck. Uh, you get it to him so he can perform his magic. So you saw that magic kind of among the, with Rick Martin and Rene Robert. But they had different personalities also, didn't they? All, uh, three different guys all together, yeah. Uh, the quiet one and the, the humble one was uh, Gilbert. I always see him when I, you know, I was mentioning Bobby Orr is like that, Gordy Howe, um, Perot. So many of these, the real great players in the game, were very quiet. They weren't... Uh, they weren't uh, narcissistic. They didn't. They need, didn't. There wasn't a need to have somebody tell you that you're great or you're capable of doing this and how good you are. They, they really didn't matter to them. Um, they just kind of knew it, you know. Kind of like if you're wealthy enough, you don't have to tell anybody. You know, you just everyone knows. <laughs> 
So, um, talk about the day you, you got parole being the quiet guy. What was Martin like? I, well, I found out how good he was when I played against him. I didn't realize how good he was when I played with him uh, because I was always yelling at him to back check and come back and help us out. Great going one way, but you have to, you know, couldn't find him with the hockey news when it would come back to back checking. But given the puck, he was an absolute, uh, he, was, he was spectacular. And when I played against him, that's when I found out. From the blue line in, he just went from five foot nine up to about six foot nine. He had such a um, uh, a need to score, like he couldn't he couldn't live with himself. If he didn't score. He had to find a way to score, and he just you know skated so hard. Once he got the puck, was going on the offense. It made it difficult to play against him. Very very difficult. That whole line could do a lot of things, and Robert would always be coming late. Always late, you know, you'd forget about him, and he'd be, Gilbert and, and Rick would be pushing the pace a little bit, and then Rene would kind of, you know, kind of float in just behind it, but one or two seconds behind the play. And he'd be picking up, everybody would be going at the other two, and then he would just kind of find the, uh, the quiet areas to jump into, and he could pound the puck really hard. Uh, you then get traded to the Canucks. I did, yeah, I did. And, and that, My friend Punch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and was was uh, had you established enough of a relationship at that time with the Sabers that that was a that was a tough trade for you or just the next? It was awful. Moment? It's awful. If I had any money behind me, if I would have had maybe another five six years in the National Hockey League, I wouldn't have went probably. I mean, I love Buffalo that much, and I had a. An opportunity to um, do a few things outside of hockey at that point, and uh, I might not have went. Uh, you know, Buffalo meant that much to me. I just, I just fell in love with this whole, this whole area, this Western New York area. So, um, but I moved on, and uh, ended up my career in Vancouver. In uh, '77, I think January, I played my last game there. And then after an injury, I came back, uh, moved back to Buffalo. You commenced the lawsuit. You're one of the first guys to actually sue the club, if you will, for negligence and treatment of you, which is reminiscent of what happened to, what happened to Rick Martin as well. The, um, there was always a problem with the, when you sue the National Hockey League, there was, wouldn't, wouldn't be much longer when you'd get offered a job as a scout or you'd get offered something. They just quiet it down and slip you fifty thousand, give you a pat in the ass, and tell you to get lost, give you a job as a scout, and that was it. Um, we elected to um, not to do that, and we had the head of our one of the problems we had at Players Association was Alan Eagleson, who was charged for thirty two counts, I think, in Boston. They nailed him for yeah, the other thirty two counts. <coughs> Fraud, money laundry, everything. This is the head of our players' association, and he was selling us out to the owners. And like, they had a CBA, they're trying to finish up, and they couldn't finish it up. And he said, "I'll tell you what." He says, uh, "Why don't you take the old players, the older players, uh, take their surplus pension, and give that to the players now, guarantee them two hundred fifty thousand dollars." A check when they're 55 years old, and uh, that did it. So the players signed the CBA. So not only did these players who are filthy rich now bail out on us, so did the owners. So did uh, the whole thing was a mess. As it turned out, we uh, the association, the players' association, sued the National Hockey League. We not only got all our money back, but there were damages and other things they had to pay for. It. It bumped it up from 24, I think, to about 49 million that they got to uh, split up with the players. That you know, the game was built on the back of Gordy Howe and Bellavo and these great players. Now all of a sudden, this thing goes to trial, and guess who the judge is? The judge is a guy at one time was his hero <laughs> was the guy was Gordy Howe and players like that. 
And he was so protective of us, of these older players, and had such a, uh, uh, a sense of um, a feeling for the whole case. Because he grew up with these players, I guess. And he, he was very protective. And we won, we won, they, the Players Association won that lawsuit hands down. And we got all our money back and more. The one I went through, uh, they appealed. They lost the appeal and went to the Supreme Court of uh, British Columbia. They turned down the appeal, uh, the appeal there. Not only that, we made new law. Uh, they raised the judgment up. And when they won, when they lost the first time around, judgment came down and they had the first appeal. Uh, they wanted to, I think, the settlement, I forget what it was. In Canada, it's not big settlements. It would have been $10 million down here. Up there, it was like 500000 or something like that. But um, the judge said, you're not going to pay for this appeal and robotize back. Just, I want $500,000, I want it in escrow. And that money stays and collects interest until this thing is over. And that was not, uh, that hadn't happened up there in law before, so it was, uh, it was pretty interesting. We caught everybody in that trial lying, the team, we caught them in so many lies. I would say, actually, I was embarrassed for them I was embarrassed for the game. Um, we caught the team doctor, and you know, the team doctor should be working for us, not for the team. In those days, they worked for the team and the owners. They got the free parking, to took us to the game, and God knows what else, uh, whatever he wanted. And, uh, but all the decisions, the physical decisions, in regards to players being injured, would always go in favor of the team. Unless the bone was sticking right through the skin, I mean, you had to find a way to play. Um, you weren't going to get a break. And um, the night they took me out, well, I played three games with a broken neck. I was cursed into playing. I was going to be sent to the minors or traded. This is stuff that was in the paper. It's not stuff I'm making up. I mean, that's a quote from them. And they kept on saying, yeah, we'll fix, uh, we'll have the team doctor take a look at it, we'll have this doctor take and they never did. They said it was all in my head. What happened the year before was, and they started that thinking, interestingly enough, which is not a big deal nowadays, in which if some people in here don't have it, they certainly know people that have a problem with panic attacks and agoraphobia. And, they, and I, that's what I had at that point. I don't know where it came from, but I didn't know it was. All I knew is that I thought I was dying, you know, from these horrible panic attacks. And they would lace you with uh, Valium in those days, and, uh, uh, you know, pockets full of diazepam and vials full of it. It was just, you know, just throw it at you as much as you wanted. I'd be downing like 40, 50 milligrams of Valium a day to get through a game. And then uh, never at any time would they ever tell you, don't go and have a drink. Don't drink a half a quart of scotch after the game when you're on this stuff. I mean, none of this stuff has ever, you know, passed on to you. But ever since then, that, well, it's all in his head. It's all in his head. He's making an up. He's a head case. And as it turned out, they were totally wrong. And uh, finally, I played the fourth game. A guy came by me and bumped into me, and I went down on the ice. And uh, for the third time, and third game in a row, where I just lost control of my limbs involuntarily, just shaking, and this time it was really bad. My career was over that night. They didn't take me off the ice in a, uh, in a stretcher. They uh, picked me up, and they had me like, you know, you put your arms over the guy's shoulder, and he, you know, and they're giving me hell all the way in uh, to get off the ice. They're giving me hell for not keeping my skates straight, uh, straight on the ice because they had to drag me. And I slid at one point, I slid right down and I went on the ice. I always remember, there were 18,000 people at that game last, that night, and went dead silent. And some guy yelled out, he said, why don't you kill him? <laughs> that's how bad it looked. Why don't you kill him? And that's exactly what it looked like. So they got to die. They, they finally got a stretcher off the ice and got me into the dressing room. The doctor comes in, he picks my feet up, boom. He goes, I, I can't hold my legs up. 
I, uh, I couldn't hold a cigarette between my fingers. I couldn't hold a cup of water. I had a broken neck. And, a, and, a, uh, and my spinal and my uh, brain stem was uh, contused, along with the cord. I ended up having two contusions in it. So at that point, I'm a, I can't do anything. I can't even take a shower because I can't take the water hitting my body or hitting the floor and bouncing up onto my legs. It was so painful. And uh, so they wrapped me up in a blanket, and uh, Isabel was in the washroom at that time. She was pregnant as my wife, and she came out and she missed the whole thing. So she came out and said, well, where's Michael? He's not on the bench. And she says, you better go downstairs. And the doctor came out and told her, said, uh, take him home, give him a shot of Carvassier. He'll be fine in the morning. <laughs> and uh, that's how that was left that night. Uh, I barely got home, and they ended up, it was like 5.30 or 6 o'clock in the morning, I hear, you know, there's, there's a guilt knock on the door. <laughs> they got thinking about it, and they got me uh, to the hospital, and the head of neurosurgery came in and checked me out, and he got a hold of the head doctor for the team and said, uh, you better get back in there and check that boy out. And he says, you're 100% wrong. This is great stuff coming out during the trial. And, uh, you know, when he came in and checked me, I, I was so hypersensitive, I mean, it hit my leg and it was just flying all over the place. And really, really sick. And um, so that's, that was the end of my career, and uh, they tried to force me into playing still. Uh, made me go to practice. Made me put my uniform, they made me uh, get dressed. This was like months after. And they figured, well, we'll get him out in the ice with all the other players. He'll be too embarrassed to pull, pull this stuff off from his teammates. So they aligned everybody up at the end of the ice. So, okay, let's go back and forth. Once, one at a time. It was my turn. Took a stride and I fell down. Got up, took a stride, fell down. And three times I fell down. I couldn't couldn't stand. I just tried to fall down. And uh, so I remember the coach, he started coming over to me. And I grabbed my stick like that and I said, don't, don't even get another inch close near me. Uh, I would have hit him right in the head with it. And uh, so I crawled off the ice. I got home. My wife picked me up and got me home. And uh, that's when the lawsuit started. And uh, <sighs> I'll just, uh, I'll just cut this really short, give you an idea how bad it was. The, uh, at the end of one of the uh, days of the trial, the court clerk calls us over. And my attorney was a guy called John Laxton, who was a, quite a significant labor lawyer, among other things, in Western, all Western Canada. And he said, Mr. Laxton, uh, stay behind, I'll show you something. And so, um, Everyone leaves, and John, my attorney, says, told Isabel and I to stay there, and the little court clerk says, you sh <laughs> you know, don't mind, you're going to give me a shit air. I said, you've got to keep this quiet. He says, come here, I want to show you something. The team doctor said the night I got injured, when I took the stand, I said, yeah, the doctor came in, this is what he said. He lifted my leg up, he did this and that, and he... And, uh, and so, the, are you sure it was doc, the team doctor? And look at him, he said, yeah, it was. I know it was. So the team doctor takes a stand, and he hands in a document. He said, uh, Doc, I forget his name now. Um, he said, where were you the night of such and such, that game? He said, were you at the game that night? And he says, no, I wasn't. The legs come up like this, the arms go back, you know, and he said it with great arrogance on top of it, which was driving the judge crazy. And um, he says, I wasn't even at the game. And he hands in it, they have a document saying that he was at a business meeting that night at uh, the Berbutus Club in Vancouver, and uh, the meeting was over at 
So I guess Mike's lying. Now I'm in trouble. <coughs> and um, as it turned out, the court clerk <coughs> calls him up and shows him the sheet of paper. He puts it up on an x-ray machine. And guess what they did? They whited it out. And the time the, um, the meeting was over was like 6.30 or 6.45, not 10.30. But it was x-rayed, and with the white of it, never you could see it underneath, that they played around with it. So that, that's the type of stuff they were pulling off. And then you have the head of your Players Association. He can't give you any time to uh, come out and protect you. Um, he said, I'm on my way to Hawaii. He said, I'll give you 45 minutes, that's all. He says, I've got to continue on my way to Hawaii. This is the head of your Players Association. So as it turned out, we, uh, we won the lawsuit. It got appealed. And um, they, what I had great satisfaction from was that from then on, they took a little better care of the players. I got great satisfaction from that. Guys weren't dragged off the ice anymore. You see a player go down, you know, the neck brace goes down now and the, you know, the stretcher. The liability is so great, especially now with these head cases and so on. I mean, I, this is, I could tell you other stories about concussions. <laughs> Whatever you read about, about football and hockey and lawsuits and concussions, you better believe it. And you better, times 10 is about the real truth of how bad it was and the coercion that was going on. They were so good that I, they, would get, they would get their own teammates. They, they'd have your own teammates, your peers. They'd flip them on you also. So they would, your peers wouldn't even like you anymore, you know, if you didn't play beyond all reason. Um, so they, uh, Finally, uh, we hung in there long enough, and we got enough money to pay off our bills and so on, and uh, we got back on our feet, and I'm left with a disability uh, for the rest of my life, and, uh, you know, to this day, I, they, have, they, they wouldn't even acknowledge it, you know, or, or have the, um, I don't know, I, I, I just feel so much sad for like, you know, so their souls are so crippled up in so many different ways. I, I just, uh, it's just not right that, uh, you know, things that they got away with. But they didn't get away with that one. And so now a lot of these players are covered nowadays and these players have no sense of history. They wouldn't know this story from the Hill of Beans. Nor do they care. Um, so they just move on. The game has changed dramatically. The biggest changes have been financially. And uh, the players are better taken care of. Uh, they're not used quite as much as like they used to be used. And uh, here I am today to talk about it. So I've got four beautiful grandkids and a wonderful marriage, 40 some years. And um, I'm in fairly good health. Just retired from hockey, and I think I'm a pretty lucky guy. I accomplished more than I ever expected, and it's almost freaky that it could happen. But um, I always show. I meant to bring it today. It was when I was 19 years old. I'm playing for the Rangers, and I'm standing. It's funny how things work out. If you want something bad enough, or you you visualize it, which athletes do a lot of that now. They visualize. They think about. It situations that will happen in a game. Without even thinking, your subconscious mind will just kick in and you'll do it. A certain guy comes down the ice at you and you've been thinking about it in bed that afternoon, you know, you're, if this situation comes up and you, and you automatically just go there without thinking. And um, I, I forget where I was going now with the visualization part of it. Uh, but, uh, you were the Rangers uh, yeah. a moment here? Oh, yeah, so how about this? I'm 19 years old, and the greatest thrill in my life as an athlete was when I was a kid, we all, most of us in here, I'm sure, say, remember the cards with the players' pictures on them and so on? If you didn't use them for the bikes to make the thing, you'd save them, or if your mother didn't throw them out. And uh, 
I'm a, I must have had over 2,000. I had 2,000 of those things. They're all over the place. I don't know where they are now. But that was the biggest thrill I ever had in hockey. I'm 19 years old. The game's over. I'm leaning against the wall of Madison Square Gardens, and this little kid comes over, and um, he hands me the, the card. And I look at the card. Oh, my God, my picture's on it. <laughs> I never even, I forgot about it. And my picture was on this card. And it, I, I, was just, I, I was just thrilled. You know, where'd you get it? <laughs> you know, Do you want it? I'll get you another one. You know, like I'll never get one again. And on the back, you know the little characters? They had a, they had a cartoon character they'd make of you in, in the back. And it said, Mike Robitaille, a hard-shooting right-handed defense from, from Midland. Uh, hard, low shot from the point. And then it had me, the character was me skating down the ice with a microphone in my hand. And says, someday Mike would like to be a broadcaster. Oh, wow. <laughs> so what the hell have I got to complain about? You know, I just, more than I ever dreamt about. You just took away this entire setup here. I just want Sorry, to Mike. Mike Robitaille recalls his hockey card. The, there it is, right there. Yeah. Beautiful. Uh, but we, we can't let you go. And this has been an unbelievable moment, Mike. Uh, with you, but you then became for 25 years a broadcaster extraordinaire with the Buffalo Sabres, Empire Network, and all those various pieces. But the big dog during that time period was Rick, is G Rick Jenneret. Yeah. You must give us a Rick Jenneret story or two. He's a good beer drinker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's, um, I, uh, they're both in the Hall of Fame, and I had an opportunity to work with both uh, Ted Darling. Ted Darling got me my job. He's the one, so I have a special place in my heart for him. Um, they are both really good announcers, and Rick was, you know, he, he's extremely exciting, especially you go back years ago. He's getting up there now, and, um, you know, it's, I don't know what's going to happen at this point, but... Um, he could make a, the worst game into a great game, especially if you're listening to it on radio. You'd actually think there was a good game going on. It'd be the worst game you ever watched in your life. You know those Hartford games that just went on and on and on? That was the first time I got fired, I remember. And I wonder why. Um, it was so bad, I was so sick and tired of watching Hartford and Buffalo play. <laughs> I remember Ted Darling was in the game when I said it. He reached over and he grabbed my hand. <laughs> I said, you know, Ted, this is just unbelievable watching this game. I can't believe anybody would be stupid enough to take some money out of their pocket <laughs> and buy a ticket to watch these two teams play tomorrow night. And the game was in Buffalo. <laughs> so the next day, Nordy Knox wanted to speak to me <laughs> and he said this will be the last the last warning and uh, so I kind of I knew how far to go at that point and that was it but uh, yeah Rick was I, I, they're just very different people to work with Ted Darling was just like driving a Cadillac Rick was like a souped up Corvette tough to work with you better not make any mistakes. You better know your stuff. And, you know, like, sharp. Ted was just smooth and professional and very, very nice cadence to his game. So there are two different people, both, both in the Hall of Fame. So who am I to uh, have anything negative to say about it? They're both very good announcers, and I got to work with both of them. And then Harry Neal came along. There's another I got Work with Harry Neal, and Harry's in the Hall of Fame. So, do you make Hall of Famers? That really is your your do. I do. I don't get paid for it. That's. <laughs> <laughs> this has been incredible. Uh, this is a moment in time, Mike, and I can't thank you enough for coming down here to Jamestown, uh, renewing your acquaintance to this city. Uh, we're big Saber fans down here, and big fans of Mike Robotai. Ladies and gentlemen, Mike Robotai. <laughs>